Welcome to the Thriving Farmer Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Kilpatrick. Our mission is to inspire, educate, and celebrate sustainable farming. We believe that you can build a profitable, sustainable farm that gives you true farm freedom. Join us as we talk to farmers, innovators, educators, and entrepreneurs to glean their top takeaways in business and life. Hey, Thriving Farmers, Michael here. So today's podcast guest is Gowan Batiste, and she farms out at Fortunate Farm on the California coast. So it's really cool to have a conversation with someone who's in a very interesting and a more brittle environment, being out there with the low amount of water that they get and the partnerships that they have actually used to build the farm. So obviously land in California is not cheap and Gowan was able to partner with the North Coast Brewing Company. They actually own some of the land for the farm and actually pay her salary on the farm. And so it's really cool to kind of see how the farm operates and how the farm has now become really a family affair with many members of her family involved in the production, as well as just friends in the community who have purchased land around the farm to actually build more of a farming community. So we chatted all sorts of things. She has animals on the farm. They do a large compost operation. And the reason for the compost operation is all the waste products from the North Coast Brewing Company come on farm where they're composted for the pasture as well as the market garden that they have there. So it's very interesting to hear the story of that, her journey into farming, being a fifth generation farmer and kind of what she enjoys doing. Like a lot talked about pumpkins, which is also a shared passion of mine and dahlia production. So definitely a great listen. And it's not only a listen for the farming aspect, but for her views on the community aspect of farming in general. And that we shouldn't look at large scale agriculture workers as competitors, but also people in our own space that we should be rooting for because when large-scale ag has to pay more money to their workers, the cost of food will in general go up, which is also good for small farmers. So really great information and a great podcast and appreciate Gowan for coming on and sharing her story with us. Gowan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me on. Uh, Can you give us a little bit more overview of your farming operation? Sure. So Fortunate Farm is on the Mendocino Coast. It's a core 40 acres of uh, pasture, pumpkins and flower fields. Um, We have a market garden, a vegetable operation, and we do um, planned grazing, um, mostly with sheep, but also with cattle and geese. Very cool. And tell us about your background. How'd you get into farming? So I actually grew up here on the coast. I'm fifth generation uh, Mendocino County. So I've, I've really gotten to kind of see agriculture evolve here over my whole lifetime. My, my mom is actually still involved in, in running the Sea Ranch and my great, great grandparents' farm is still the community farm there. So I grew up in this area, uh, grew up involved in agriculture, went off to college, was gone for years, and then actually came back to the community to run a farm to school program in the area. And through that journey, started working with North Coast Brewing Company, and that ultimately led me here to the purchase of this farmland in 2014 in partnership with North Coast Brewing Company. Very cool. So what do you love about farming? You know, I've done very few other things in my life. Um, So I mostly think about it in comparison to to those things. I love that I'm outside all day, every day. You know, it's a very Mm -hmm. rare day that I spend a significant amount of it inside. I really like, I love being kind of in conversation with the larger, the larger ecology. And what I especially love about being a farmer in this day and age is like, I love the fact that like, I feel very connected and able to communicate with people who are living with landscapes and managing climate change and working on regenerative agriculture all around the world, Mm -hmm. while at the same time being really deeply connected to this one specific place. Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, the name of the farm is Fortunate Farm. Why that name? It was actually um, my grandfather's last words. My grandfather was a huge part of raising me. We lived on the same, the same land, and he taught me about farming, taught me to use a chainsaw, taught me to drive a big truck. And when he passed away, the last 
words that he spoke, you know, we, the family was with him and he was with my grandmother as he just looked at my grandmother and said, fortunate. Mm. And I think that that made a huge impression on all of us. Mm. And it's something that really like strive to emulate and, and move forward is just that, that sense of really like, you know, living, living a life that we can look back on that way. Yes, absolutely. That's beautiful. So talk to me a little bit about the brewery. So how does that intersect with the farm? So I work with North Coast Brewing Company in in a number of ways, but um, to begin with, the farm started as a partnership. So the farm is in two legal parcels. And when we purchased it, we bought one parcel and the brewery bought the other parcel. I think the most immediate relationship is um, we run a small composting operation. We have a little frontier windrow turner mm-hmm. and compost um, the spent grain from the brewing company. Um, unlike most brewing brewers grain in this country, uh, North Coast Brewing Company has a mash plate filter. So okay. the, um, the barley hulls that come out have a much lower moisture content, making it ah. like really amazing for composting. It's, it's just an awesome material to work with. It's pathogen free. It's salt free. It's like, it's great. And so mm-hmm. um, we do a small compost operation. It's usually around 60 yards at a time on site here um, that we spread on rangeland. Um, we okay. kind of follow the same protocol as the Marin Carbon Project and mm-hmm. that we also use in our no-till market garden. Vegetables from our market garden go back to North Coast Brewing Company's tap room. And then over the years, I've also worked with them on you know, projects around sustainability and their, their B Corp certification. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about that compost uh, operation. So you've got, it's, you said it's comes in as a lot drier of a product. There's not as much salt in it, which is great. Um, And then what do you mix that with to really get the windrows going? Yeah. So I I was comparing it to like, like animal manure, which is notorious for having salt in it. Gotcha. Um, It's um, yeah. So what we mix it with is it's about 50% wood chips so it, it's actually a very low nitrogen. It's more like a mulch. Okay. Um, what, I'm, what I'm really interested in is not so much a soluble fertilizer, but in like a surface mulch. You know, I, I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with soils out here, but we have very vulnerable sandy soils yes, that like to dry out and yes. have our nutrients just fall right through them. Mm-hmm. So what we're really looking at, at doing is like how we can make a stable microbial environment. Mm-hmm. And then I also do vermicomposting so that we can have like some more um, soluble nutrient dense compost material for our greenhouse. Mm-hmm. Um, so and for, for example, like we took our market garden field when we started, it was at around 2% soil organic matter. It's at 6% now, Wow. six years later and um, with an 18% variance between mm-hmm. our 15 centimeter measurement and our 45 centimeter measurement, which I'm not putting compost anywhere near that deep in the soil. I'm, we're doing a light surface layer, mm-hmm. about, about a quarter inch of application. If that, what's happening though, is that we're creating conditions where um, atmospheric drawdown can happen. Mm-hmm. So we're getting nutrients and organic matter being pulled down through the soil horizon by microorganisms. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the love of my life, actually. That's my favorite thing in the world. (laughs) Yeah. So could could you use more compost if you could produce it? Is is what's the the, uh, bottleneck there? Is just the the amount that they produce Um, or? So we're our on-farm composting permit per like our, you know, like our environmental Mm -hmm. health is our regulating agency. We're limited to 100 yards at a time unless we Uh, wanted to apply for a larger scale permit, which frankly, mm -hmm. like. I don't see us ever needing that much ever, even if the brewery could produce it, which, you know, they're very water efficient with Mm -hmm. the the mash plate filter. That's one of the things that they do for sustainability, which means that there's actually not a ton of of spent grain produced per amount of beer made. So I'm, to be honest, I'm really, I'm really happy at this amount. I think that, you know, our real like next horizon is compost application on more rangeland. Gotcha. We have some like really large scale pasture rehabilitation going on mm-hmm. out there. We have some, you know, we've only been here for almost six years now. And, um, you know, we kind of came into some pretty badly um, degraded pasture. So mm-hmm. that's my, my next big exciting project. 
Very cool. Yeah, I'm just asking because I think we had Josh Satin on the podcast a couple months mm. ago, and he was doing, I think, like six inches of compost at a time. So they're basically farming in like almost pure compost. And so I just think it's really interesting the different techniques people are using. You're doing a lot less. I mean, it could just be uh-huh. the, your, the brittleness of your environment. And uh, so anyway, yeah, there's just always lots of ways to do it. And so very interested to hear how yeah, you guys are doing that. I, I know. So I actually um, did a lo- local radio show on regenerative agriculture for a couple of years and interviewed Ben Hartman. And he uh-huh. was talking about like eight to 10 inches of compost. And I think that, that you can totally do that as long as, you're, as long as you're not doing too much disruptive tillage and as long as you're managing runoff. Like I'm personally totally comfortable with those amounts of compost. I just haven't found it that we, that we really need that. And we uh-huh. also um, haven't invested in equipment like a screen. Mm. So a lot of our compost material has like, you know, we don't have a big vibratory screen. So we have wood chip material in our compost. It's really, it's a surface top dressing mulch. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, Yeah. And I'm happy with that. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Let's talk about irrigation because California irrigation is always a challenge as well. Are you guys doing a lot of drip or overhead? So we do drip for virtually everything. We use overhead like micro sprinklers for Mm -hmm. uh, germinating carrots, radishes, baby greens, that sort of thing. Everything else is drip. And what I've actually found is that as our soil health has improved, um, the ability to buffer water has increased so much that actually, so I... I, I grow a, a lot of um, of dahlias, or like mm-hmm. as their their real name is, this chichipatl. And I have a block that I've actually been trying to dry off so that I can harvest the tubers for over mm-hmm. a month, and they are still going strong. You know, that takes very little water. Wow. You know, once a plant is established and you have good soil structure, and we also are in an environment where we get watered by the morning fog every morning. You know, gotcha. we're we're right by the ocean. Yeah. So talk to me how that happens and the fog rolls in and it just kind of starts to blanket the ground and is it kind of like getting rained yeah. on every day? Yeah. I mean, the marine fog layer is pretty heavy and it, it burns off generally by about 10 a.m. Like right mm-hmm. now it's, it's clear and warm here, but pretty much every morning we'll have a heavy, heavy um, dew on the grass and the ground is wet. Mm-hmm. So that's nice. We have irrigated pasture without the trouble of having to irrigate it. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So what does a typical day look like for you on the farm? So for me, every day starts with checking on animals. Okay. That's the first thing that happens. Depending on the time of the year, there's different things that that looks like. Generally speaking, at any given time, there's about four different flocks moving around the farm in electric fencing. So um, that's what my day begins with. That might look like, you know, checking electric fence for charge. Sometimes when we have young lambs, we use livestock trailers as portable shelters Mm -hmm. um, because we have a very high predator population, which we're quite proud of, but we also still need to dissuade from eating our lambs. So I will let them out in the morning. (laughs) Uh, I often do moves in the morning, you know, moving the animals around the farm. And then usually for me in the growing season, the next stop is I'll take a walk through the field, usually with a cup of tea and check for irrigation leaks. Because okay. um, in, in, in my big field, I run everything on timers overnight. Okay. Um, so I, I go out to like make sure that everything ran well in the night, basically. And our farm is very public. You know, we have an on-site farm stand. We have a lot of visitors. So the rest of my day could look anything like giving tours, greeting people, harvesting, shearing sheep, teaching a class. Yeah, all the stuff we all do. <laughs> gotcha. So as a farmer, there are endless tasks to be done. We just talked about. So what systems do you set up to make sure that you tackle the most vital priorities every day? I do a lot of list making. I, okay. I definitely found that getting addicted to box checking is a great thing for a farmer. Okay. Um, and the, But like looking at like what is proximate, like what is the thing that can be done right now? Mm-hmm. And then what is like, short-term goal, what is medium-term goal, and what is long-term goal, like all those things shift and can be in flux. Uh For me, it's like having a directional seasonal goal is really important, especially like, you know, planning ahead with livestock Uh when we're doing complex moves. 
And it's the same with the field too. It's like you have your multi-seasonal like cover crop and rotation plan. And then you have your, that thing just broke today plan. Yes. You know, yeah, and yeah, yeah. being able to leave space, you know, being able to have like really to get out of analysis paralysis by being able to like maintain the big picture, but still like really just focus on what's in front of you today. Like mm-hmm. that is something that some of us are better at than others. For me, it's definitely, um, it's definitely something that I struggle with every year. And my solution to it has, has really been like, usually when I'm still in bed in the morning, when it's still dark out, I make a checklist for the day. And then Mm. I update it after my morning checks. Mm -hmm. And then I look at it again when I sit down at lunch, (laughs) you know, and like that, um, when you're managing a lot of complexity, I I feel like, like that really helps. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Very cool. So who are your mentors in farming? So, I mean, I have been really lucky. Like, so I grew up in a community that it, um, there was a lot of um, back to the landers here, a lot of 70s communes, um, a lot of specifically actually um, lesbian women's communes in my area. Mm. And so I'm really lucky that a lot of those women have been my farming mentors. Like I was taught to shear by a woman. I was taught to butcher um, by a woman. I was taught to drive a tractor by a woman. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think outside of that, um, I, I learned a lot from my grandpa and my grandma growing up, but also like, I'm a really, really big believer in continuing education. And Mm -hmm. I read voraciously audiobooks are a very important part of my life. Mm -hmm. And I've been really inspired by a lot of this, the, the young generation of farmers who are kind of going out and writing. I actually just read Ben Goldfarb's book recently. Okay. It's about beavers, but like it's a very fascinating book about water and ecology for anybody that's managing landscapes. Mm. Um, yeah, but you know, I think that like continuing to have mentors, and especially now that I've been doing this for about 10 years, um, I, I just turned 30, you know, really striving to try to have mentors that are younger than me too. Mm-hmm. And to continue like, you know, looking to like the next generations too. Exactly. Yeah. And I think so many times that the older we get, we sometimes get boxed in a bit and getting reminded by the younger generation about just breaking those boxes is so important. If there was like a magic reset button as it relates to starting the farm, what system would you go back and put in place sooner rather than later? Oh my gosh. I think the thing that I would do over if I had a do over is I wouldn't have actually started growing as as soon as I did. I would have spent mm. the time to fix the buildings, to to put in ir- new irrigation lines. I, I you know because like a lot of that rush mm. um, turns into backtracking mm-hmm. and turns into redundancy. And actually, mm-hmm. so you know when I I was managing farms that I didn't own for years before we did this, and I was very very excited to plant fruit trees and, you know, do big perennial systems. And then once I got here, I got totally daunted because, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to have to live with, with those things permanently. Now it's a, it totally changes the relationship. Mm -hmm. And there's stuff that I did too soon that I've since had to work around or undo. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that, that really just, just slowing down and not putting off housing. That's the number one thing is that, you know, I really put off paying attention to these old falling down buildings. And now it's like six years later and they're still old falling down buildings. And now I have to do something about them. So there's a huge tendency in that in farming. I see that in like every single one of my peers. And I think that that (laughs) we all do it. Um, And in hindsight, we say that we wish we hadn't, but that would probably be the reset. Mm. Absolutely. Gotcha. With that, I'd like to stop cool. here and take a break. In a minute, we'll be back with Gowen from Fortunate Farm. If you've been enjoying this episode so far, you're going to want to head over to growingfarmers.com backslash free resources and download our free resource bundle to help you shave hours off your week and become a thriving farmer. It includes resources such as our 10 winter growing secrets we wish we knew when we started, which is a ebook which talks about the tips and techniques to get better growth in your winter production. We teach things like the simple but counterintuitive principle that trips up most beginning growers, 
the shape and size of tunnels that are best for winter production, how to prepare beds so they are weed-free and get beautiful lush stands of crops, what to do about pests like aphids, voles, and slugs, how to fast-track your research to fine-tune your production for your microclimate, and how to pack in more crops for higher yields and profits. So head over to growingfarmers.com backslash free resources and download your free resource bundle today. We are back with Gowan from Fortunate Farm, and um, let's talk a little about your labor situation. Do you farm alone? Do you have some um, workers there on the farm? So I farm collectively, and I farm with family, and it's really been, I mean, like, people are always the best and the most challenging parts of farming, Mm -hmm. in my experience, but I feel so grateful for the community that's built up around the farm. And actually it has expanded over, over, over the years. So some of our first employees on the farm who actually still, still work on the farm, they're over in the field right now, bought the 20 acres next door for us when it came up for sale. And so now we're working collaboratively on projects there. And then our, our vegetable manager this year just bought the 20 acres to the South of us. Oh, wow. um, We just closed us like a month ago. And my other friends, Jim and Judy, bought 10 acres on the other side of them. And then Julia bought 15 acres uh, just to the east of Cam and Megan, who bought one of the 20-acre parcels. And so we've, we've kind of ex- we've expanded quite a bit and, mm-hmm. um, and have begun really working on more of a community level. Mm-hmm. And much more collaboratively, like we're actually in the process right now of buying a piece of equipment for all of us to share and going through the process of, you know, creating agreements around like communal ownership and management of expensive equipment. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, to me, like nothing is better than that. And then I'm, I'm also like incredibly lucky, like this really, this is a family farm, you know, my mom and my stepdad live on the farm. My mom is the business manager my stepdad's a retired school teacher and he's involved in our farm stand. My auntie, um, Ui, um, runs our farmer's market with my cousin on Yawu and my nephew, Akaika, um, who's here all the time. And my other aunt, Bippy, and my cousin, Noah, <laughs> and my best friend from high school, Clara, who's Noah's partner, are all involved in the farm. Wow. So that is so cool. It's, it's very much a community operation. So let's talk a little bit about the the land acquisition. So are all those different parcels being farmed separately for their own things or are they kind of just being purchased and then you guys are kind of farming them collectively? So it's a little bit of both, um, especially because they're very recent. A lot Mm -hmm. of these, you know, Sam just closed last month. Okay. Um, So what we've been doing at Sam's place is we've been doing grazing and um, invasive species remediation and just, just the first step into that. My friends Ami and Liu, who live on the farm here, manage a small herd of goats. They have 20 goats that they do invasive species remediation with. So they're working with Sam. Mm. Um, So we're all working together in in different ways. But because it's early days, I'm not entirely sure what the final picture will look like. Mm. Um, I think that, you know, there's, there's an orchard at Cam and Megan's and another orchard at Julia's. We're selling fruit at the farm stand. We've had bees and and sold honey at the farm stand. So we're collaborating in a lot of ways. We don't really have a model where there's like, we don't have like a traditional hierarchical, Mm -hmm. like corporate model where we're like leasing and farming on other farms. It's, it's much more collective based. Mm-hmm. Very cool. So the the environment you guys are in, you're north of the, the city. So um, you, you have the mm-hmm. farm stand, but let's talk a little bit about the marketing side of this. So you have on farm, you're also sending product down to the brewery. What percentage of product goes to them? What percentage goes to the farm stand? So, you know, it, it fluctuates a lot seasonally mm-hmm. for obvious reasons. But I'd say that the majority of our produce is sold on, on site just because the farm stand is so busy. Wow. And then the, the tap room um, is our, our main um, wholesale account. And it'll generally be around like 30 to 50% depending on the time of the year. Mm-hmm. Um, we actually found that it was more profitable for us to get smaller with the vegetable operation. In the gotcha. past, we've actually sold produce all the way to San Francisco through a wholesaler, Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we did much larger scale 
And really what, what we found is that the orders got bigger, but our paycheck didn't. Yeah. And that we were all more comfortable and happier at about an acre and a half market garden scale. And actually the margins are better too. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, other than one farmer's market, the majority of our retail sales happen on site. Gotcha. And in that market garden, what is your main crops? Are you doing the full range? Have you specialized in certain things? So we have pared down over the years towards things that grow really well in our climate and that we can sell really well. So we grow a lot of like mixed rainbow carrots, um, a lot of lettuces, the brassica family all do really well on the coast, potatoes and beets, peas, things like that. Um, a lot of cherry tomatoes and a hoop house. Um, if we're talking about the the market garden. We also have an herb garden that um, Liu, who manages the goat herd, is also involved in in creating that has both um, native and um, introduced medicinal plants. Mm-hmm. Um, that's really beautiful and educational. And then the big field, which is five acres, is my project. And that's mostly dahlias and pumpkins, um, okay. which is really fun and seasonally incredibly hectic because we yeah. have like we have we have eight school groups coming next week. Oh, wow. Pumpkins. Yeah. Well, yeah, that was, so. yeah, that was one thing that we did this year with some pumpkins. And uh, unfortunately, we're in a very small town, so we didn't sell as many as I would have liked. <laughs> but yeah, I need. I should have talked to the school groups. That's a great idea to get those guys out here to grab pumpkins. Now, go ahead. Yeah, we were pretty swamped. We're definitely growing more pumpkins next year. We like, cool. um, I was shocked, actually. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, the, let's talk about the dahlias. So those are another passion of yours, it sounds like. Yeah. So I really love those flowers. I was really not a flower person, although, you know, I grew up in a farming community and uh, I, across the, the lane from my house, there was a field that was full of dahlias. There was a dahlia grower on the other side of us. So um, I was around them a lot. I spent a lot of time with livestock in my early farming life. I totally was like, I'm butch. I'm, a, I'm like not a flower person. Mm-hmm. And then there were a lot of tubers here when we moved here. And so I kind of reached out to to my community to ask about them and connected with a really, a really dear friend and and partner um, who, and and farmer and activist who unfortunately passed away last year, um, who taught me about them. Mm. And it's, it's funny. We call, we call them Dahlia after the botanist who named them after himself. His last name was Dahl. Okay. Um, but their their real name, their Nahuatl name, is Chichipatl. And they are an amazing plant. And I think through um, through Zemwell's eyes, I really gained respect for them. Mm. At this point, I'm like deeply passionate about growing them. They're edible, like every part of them is edible. And I actually sell a lot of the, the flower heads and petals um, in an edible flower mix and for bakers. Oh, very um, cool. The tubers are edible. They they taste kind of like um, water chestnut. Oh, very um, cool! And they're they're amazing with like lime and chili. You know, different parts of them can be made into into medicines. Like specifically, they were uh, used by the Toltecs as like an anti spasmodic. Mm. Um, and even the Aztecs cultivated a few varieties that were super tall, and they actually used the stalks as water pipes. So I mean, it's, they're just an amazing plant. And I love that they're a, a perennial that can be divided year after year. Um, and I, I love the way that they that they work in with my rotation system. Mm-hmm. And I also really love being able to have people come and harvest them and come and see them. Because like, you know, if you have a big field that has like a few thousand plants in it, and each of them is five feet tall and covered in blooms, mm-hmm. it's a pretty, um, it's a pretty magical place to be. Yeah. So do you have a specific varieties that are your favorites? You know, there, there's dozens upon dozens. I think the, the ones that I grew in the last year for the first time that I really liked, a variety um, called Bella Barmera. Okay. It's like this big apricot with like purple hints, which is just beautiful. Islander, which is like a cream and pink and like 10 inches across and oh, wow. super prolific. That one was awesome. I mean, really, like, you kind of can't go wrong as long as they're adapted to, to where you live, you know. Mm-hmm. They, they're they pretty, they seem to really like it here. They like temperate climates. They like a lot of water. They're kind of like a rose, actually, in what they prefer. 
Very interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, we here in Ohio, it's um, we get a little bit more of extreme temperatures in the summer. We get so much hotter, and I don't think they're not they're as crazy about that heat. Probably not, but you know, if you if you have a, a place where you can, um, you, so I, I do an early season round of them in a hoop house. Okay, and they get really tall in high mm-hmm. temperatures. They get huge, and so your main issue is that they they want to crack at the base and fall. So I don't trellis the ones in the field, but I do trellis the ones in the greenhouse. So they might do just fine for you, but you just might have to take care of them a little more. Yeah, we definitely did not trellis them, and they definitely fell over. So (laughs) that's my own fault, I'm sure. (laughs) That'll happen. Yes, yes. All right, so then the the dahlias, are you selling though? You said you sell them, people can come cut them in the field. Do you also sell bouquets in the farm stand? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we sell bouquets in the farm stand and we actually do this really fun thing at farmer's market where we harvest buckets of each variety and bring them to far- farmer's market and lay them out and then people can make their own bouquets. Oh, very cool. Um, my, my cousin Wu is just really, really creative and awesome with the farmer's market and people love that. Absolutely. It's also a ton less work. I mean, making bouquets is a ton of work and people always want to stand there and fiddle with them and find the exact right one and having people make their own, they buy more flowers and they have a great time. Mm. So do you sell them by the stem then? Yes. Yeah. Very cool. Let's talk about, uh, you've been farming for a while now. What do you think the biggest mistake that beginning farmers make? Honestly, I think that the biggest mistake that I often see young farmers make is that they forget that they're part of a larger cultural context mm. and a larger political context. And they have a tendency to try to throw work at the gaps that are really created by um, issues that are social justice issues. Mm. And it's something that I definitely did when I was younger and see a lot of young farmers doing. And the reality is, is that um, even if you are working 100 hour weeks and harvesting by headlamp and destroying your knees, oh my gosh, young farmers listening to this, you will miss them when they're gone. Take care of them. Uh Is that it's very hard, even if you are doing inhuman things to yourself, to exploit yourself as much as workers are being exploited by industrial agriculture. Uh And as long as that's our competition, we're in a system that is going to be very, very difficult to thrive in. And I I wish that I was seeing, um, I see a lot of people saying like, people need to support local farmers, people need to support local food, people need to pay more for their food. And I think to a certain extent, if people have the means to do that, that's a good argument. But what I would also love to hear is industrial agriculture needs to treat its workers humanely. Mm Mm-hmm. There needs to be fair wages in farming for everybody, including undocumented people on Uh labor crews, because when that happens, things will get better for us too. Like our collective liberation is we're, we're united in that. And I think that we actually have a lot of power that in the, in the small farm movement, in the organic food movement, we have a lot of social cachet. We have a lot of visibility Mm-hmm. And I, I wish I was seeing more of us use that platform to lift up workers that are exploited, not just because it's the right thing to do, but also because it very much is tied to our ability to make a living and take care of ourselves too. Mm. So often we see it as an us versus them and it's an us and them. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and the issue, the issue really isn't the people that are, are stuck in that system. The issue is the system. Mm-hmm. And you know, so being able to to not oppose, but instead work together. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. If you could pick one, what would be your favorite farming tool? You know, um, to be honest, um, my dogs. Okay. <laughs> dogs are really just like the the heart of of my farming experience in a lot of ways, and I, I know that like a lot of you know, a lot of the questions and a lot of what what we've been talking about has been vegetable farming. Um, But for me, um, my great Pyrenees who live with the sheep Mm -hmm. are, um, I just can't even tell you. I mean, so much of my heart is just with, with those, with those dogs. I Mm -hmm. mean, I've I've seen them do everything from, you know, have baby lambs sleep on top of them um, to, to literally I've, I've seen Chago, my, my big Pyrenees charge a lion who was coming for a lamb. Wow. And with my own eyes, you know, that 
that was unbelievable. It was, they're, they're really big, by the way. I mean, people mm-hmm. maybe don't have a context for how big mountain lions are. They're actually lions. They're large animals. Yeah, they're huge. They're huge. And then my, my border collie, Fox, I mean, he's literally like an extension of my brain, Some, which unfortunately, like most of my brain, sometimes gets things wrong. <laughs> but is like utterly attuned and yeah you know his um his predecessor bucket who passed away at a very old age literally could read my brain and mm. um and would just go where my eyes were and my grandfather's dogs were that way too and it's something that you know like dogs who can do this work are rare because the jobs that they were bred to do are now rare. And like, Mm -hmm. that's, that's something that Kristen Kimball said when she was kind of talking about the same things and they're just precious, Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, it's something that, that like many other traditions that, that we do, like it's so easy to lose and so hard to get back. Um, is that relationship? Yeah. We had guard dogs for our farm in New York for our turkeys that live with the turkeys and live with the chickens. And, uh, Mm -hmm we actually had one break its front leg and it was like, Oh my gosh. And we actually did a fundraiser with our farm for people to help uh, with the vet, fee- the vet fees for that. Cause it was not cheap to get that all taken care of. Um, totally. but, but then my sister raised border collies and they absolutely, and we still have one of her border collies. My parents now have her Izzy mom, but Gracie was her mother and Gracie was literally one of the you know, it's one of those, you always have that one dog that you're like, I don't know, you can never replace it. And Gracie was just a fabulous dog. And unfortunately just got so old, she couldn't hear and got backed over by a farm vehicle one day, which was incredibly sad. But yeah, Yeah. it was, it was a sad day on the farm that day. But um, you're right. You know, these are the, the companions, which are just there to support you through your entire farm. um, Everything you do. And you're right. They do learn to read your mind and just as you said, be where they be where your eyes are. So, yeah, and really, like, so one one night there was just a horrible storm on the farm, and I was by myself, and it it the wind was blowing so hard that it blew the door of um, the calf barn open. Oh wow! And little bottle calf, I'd found all the other cows, and I could not find this little newborn bottle calf and it was raining so hard. You could, it rained so hard that my flashlight died because water got in the battery case. Oh, wow. And you know, we're in tall grass pasture with trees. Can't hear anything. And Fox took me right to her. Wow. You know, and I, I just like, I would not have wanted to go through that night without him. And he was only nine months old at that point. Mm Hmm. Wow. All right. Anything else that you'd love to wrap up with you want to share? Yeah, I, I think that what I would really like to, um, to encourage young farmers to do is really like think of your farm as part of a community ecosystem. Mm-hmm. And I would really encourage young farmers to reach out to green businesses and reach out to, to B Corps specifically. There's all kinds of ways that the work that we do is valuable mm-hmm. and can be integrated into like a green business community. Like I wouldn't be here. This farm wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be able to do this work if not for North Coast Brewing Company. Mm -hmm. And I'm incredibly lucky as a farmer to have benefits, have health insurance um, as an employee of North Coast Brewing Company. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, that the time is really right for more farmers to have symbiotic relationships like this with more businesses and so I really just encourage, encourage farmers. I know it's hard because like the work is so engrossing and like totally hypocritical on my part because I often don't leave the farm for days and days at a time. But to really like look up a little bit, look around, recognize that we are part of a larger social, uh, political, economic, ecological um, mm-hmm. ecosystem and to like make those connections. Yeah. And I, I think farmers are so poised to make such a difference because they they see so much of um, what's happening from the earth level, but because farmers are so busy yeah. frequently, they never get a chance to say those kinds of things. Exactly. And, you know, now is the time, you know, we're living through a time of really, really urgent um, climate change, really urgent socioeconomic times. It's not a good time to be out on your own. 
-hmm. but it is a really, really good time to build community and to be doing this work. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. We really appreciate your time. It's been a fun talk. And, um, you know, it's, it's always great to discuss these issues with someone who's at the front line of this on a daily basis. Cool. Well, thank you so much for having me on. Yep. Yeah, really appreciate it. So there you have it. Another episode in the books. So I'd love if you would hop on over to iTunes and leave us a rating and a review. Those mean everything to us. We love to hear what you're thinking. If you have a podcast guest that you can recommend, please pop on over to the Thriving Farmer podcast website and leave us a review. That's thrivingfarmerpodcast.com.